The sample alignment steps are so vital to successful XRR. I'm going to spend a couple of slides going over them in length. Um, this is the sort of thing that a lot of programs will have already programmed for you. There might be something automated. Perhaps if you're at a company that runs these, uh, someone who came before you already set up a batch to do this. But to understand what the steps are doing and why, to be able to troubleshoot it and to be able to understand more things about your material by looking at the shapes of these peaks are all very important. And it's worth your time to actually run through these manually to make sure that you're comfortable with them. So the first set are direct X-ray beam alignments. We're blocking the beam with a sample effectively. And these two steps are repeated alternately until there are no changes observed. If you repeat these three, four times and you keep seeing significant changes in angles, it's most likely that your sample is not securely mounted and you need to remount and restart the alignment. So the first step is z-axis. And if you're familiar with the diffractometer, the z-axis is the height of the sample in the beam. And so we're bringing the sample up from being outside of the beam or too low to be in the beam to blocking the beam completely. And the plot of that is on the lower left. Um, the direct beam without the sample uh, interfering for this particular set of optics and slits was 4e to the 7 counts per second. As we got close to the point at which the sample started to block the beam, there was a bit of reflection off the surface. You can see a small bump up. As the sample came into the beam and started blocking the beam, there's a, a linear slope downwards in intensity until it finally reaches zero and the beam's completely blocked. The correct z to set the uh, the uh, diffractometer at is half of the intensity of the direct beam. So we had 4e to the 7, we set it at the z corresponding to 2e to the 7. The next step is very important, and that's the omega axis, which is a rocking curve axis. You can see in the first schematic that I've actually put quite a bit of tilt on the sample. In that case, the sample starts to block the beam at a lower z value than is actually the correct value. So the next step, we need to correct for that tilt. And that's what we're doing with the omega optimization. The center of the scan will be zero. Rock in omega at whatever appropriate step size for your sample. And you can see the plot that we have here. We find the maximum intensity, and then we use offsets to move that to zero in this case. This particular sample was very flat. Uh, not a lot of curvature to it. And so you can see that the shape of the omega scan is uh, very sharp and fairly narrow. If you have a lot of curvature in your sample, this tends to be a lot wider, a lot more curved. If this particular plot is sort of truncated at the top, like a mesa, then it's likely that you're starting at a z value that's uh, significantly far off from the ideal z value for your sample. If you continue to iterate the steps, you will achieve the right Z, or you could go back and attempt to re-optimize in a better sense. So after we've done Z and Omega once, we're going to return to Z, because now that the sample tilt has been taken out, the Z value will change. And you can see that, again, where the previous uh, value or the previous scan line was uh, is put in a dotted line. And the new one is at a higher Z, because the sample is no longer tilted. We're still looking for a half of the direct beam intensity, and that's the Z. So it's not uncommon to have, uh, say, three Z iterations and at least two omega iterations. Shouldn't take more than five minutes total. And again, if they're not converging, uh, then you might have a sample that is actually moving around. The second set you might be less familiar with because it's very particular to XRR and sometimes grazing incidents. And that is aligning on a fringe, or at least where the fringe intensity would be. You don't necessarily need to know there would be a fringe specifically there. These steps are also repeated until no change is observed. And it's also involving omega, in this, tang, in this case, chi axis, which is perpendicular, it's a different axis. But at first, we are going to move the two theta and omega axes to non-zero values. Uh, we use a two theta of 0.5 and an omega of 0.25. I've also seen people use 0.4 and 0.2. Anything in that range is fine. It doesn't have to be a very specific number. The first scan is an omega axis optimization around 0.25. And you can see that our peak is not exactly at 0.25. Even though we have aligned it to zero in the previous steps, this particular alignment is far more refined, far more sensitive. So it's not unusual for that first omega axis optimization at the fringe to actually be a little bit off. So we bring that to 0.25 using offsets. The next step is a chi axis, which is a front to back tilt if omega is side to side. Omega, in, sorry, chi and psi tend to be uh, fairly wide, low peaks. Uh, you're looking for the maximum intensity and setting that to zero and then repeating the omega axis again. Again, three omega, two chi optimization, something like that is a common number to reach a convergence of angles, so there's no change. Um, if something is still changing, sample mounting is probably a problem.